Uh, as Shane mentioned, my name is Donovan Preza. Uh, mahalo for having me. Uh, mahalo for inviting me here to share my mana'o with you guys. Uh, title of my presentation is, We Are Who We Were, So Who Were We? Yeah. How to make sense of things. Um, I think it's important that we pay attention to approach and how we take a look at the facts and how we take a look at the history. We can ask a couple of different questions. We can ask the what is question. For example, what is Hawaii? Who are Hawaiians? Or we can ask the what it should be question. Yeah? And this na'i aupuni process puts us into the what we should do, what we ought to do, what path we ought to follow. And the thing I'd like to talk about today is for that, what we decide to do to be based on an understanding of who we are and what we are. Yeah? That education, that, that firm foundation. Another thing I'd like to talk about is definitions in context. Um, for example, can Hawaii be occupied and non-self-governing at the same time? Depending on your answer to that question will determine which of the paths you think are plausible paths to follow that I'm about to lay out. Yeah? So keep that question in mind. This framework is straight from uh, James Anaya's OHA, re OHA paper. And <clears throat> I think it serves a good backdrop for three different paths. He identifies three different paths uh, for Hawaiians, the first being for Hawaiians to, introduce, to identify themselves as indigenous peoples following the United Nations uh, DRIP, uh, Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The beneficiaries for that process are Native Hawaiians as an indigenous people. Objective of, of that path is to protect and expand cultural land, resources, and other rights within the US legal system. The second path they talk about is decolonization. Decolonization invokes the UN Charter, Article 73. If you hear to people talking about the 1959 plebiscite and 1945, Hawaii was on the UN list, America placed Hawaii on the UN list of colonies, that's the language that this path uh, evokes and follows. The third path they talk about is deoccupation. Deoccupation uh, affecting everyone living in Hawaii today, all 50th state of Hawaii citizens and also Hawaiian nationals. Uh, authority invoked is also the United Nations Security Council. The path or the reconciliation comes through the process of deoccupation. An example of uh, other countries that were deoccupied recently were Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. After 50 years of Russian occupation from the 1940s to the 1990s, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia realized they were occupied, went through the process, got deoccupied. Yeah, so that's one historical example for that path. If we take a look and analyze what each of these paths impl implicitly make us say, so path one, indigenous peoples. And let me be clear, I'm using a political definition of indigenous peoples, not a cultural definition. And that's where the, muddy, the, the waters get muddied. People will be invoking a cultural definition of indigenous peoples and then applying it to Hawaii or to a political context. And that's what I was talking about, the definitions and us needing to keep the definitions clear to understand what these things are that we're talking about. So here, in this indigenous peoples framework, there's an imp implied power dynamic. Under the UN DRIP, it's the duty of states to recognize indigenous peoples. In this framework, the state has the power and it's the duty of the state to recognize the indigenous people. 
Therefore, the indigenous people need to identify themselves as subordinate to the power of a state. We fall within the jurisdiction of the United States. Something <clears throat> that is significant about this is we have to self-identify as submissive to the state of Hawaii. Yeah, that's not explicit in all of this, but what you're saying, if you're identifying as an indigenous Hawaiian, you're saying, I am under the United States. So just think what that does and what that means. I, I just want to clarify too at this point that the UN DRIP is the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Yes. So people talk about that a lot. Um, in this framework, Hawaii is not a co-equal sovereign. We are not our own country. We are under the territorial domain of the United States. Uh, next, Shay. Also, the UN DRIP is not legally binding. Yeah, it's principles, it's things that countries should follow, but it does not, it's not international law. It does not equal an automatic clear path to this uh, destination. Next. Second path, decolonization. Next. Next. If you take a look at Article 73, Article 73 states, territories whose peoples have not yet at attained a full measure of self-government. Is this true for Hawaii? Did Hawaii not yet attain a full measure of self-government? Who says Hawaii did not attain a full measure of self-government? Who says Hawaii did? So if we did, does this definition and therefore this path apply to Hawaii? Yeah, so this is where the definitions and the context, they matter. Because if you go knocking on an international door and you say I'm this, but you're really this, they're gonna look at you like, come back when you know what you are. Yeah, so this is where we need to know what our historical context is. <clears throat> Deoccupation also has its own assumptions. Next. <clears throat> Supposes Hawaii was an independent state. Supposes that uh, the continuity of the Hawaiian state still exists. And this affects all Hawaii citizens, citizens and all Hawaii nationals. Everybody living in Hawaii is affected by this path. Yeah, both 50th state of Hawaii citizens and also Hawaiian nationals. 50th state of Hawaii citizens are protected under UN human rights. You can't just go kicking people out for historical precedent. Go look what they did in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Some countries, when it came to citizenship and nationality, went the ethnic route. Those that went that route, are now in violation of human rights violations. One of those countries followed the law of occupation and they're not in human rights violations. So it also invokes the law of occupation. Yeah, and this path also invokes the law of occupation. So the law of occupation, therefore, uh, being a path for reconciliation. This is that, ex that same chart in a visual rather than words. So we have the United Nations, and keep in mind, all of these paths are invoking the United Nations, international law, international relations. The source is all the same. It's all the United Nations. It's either Article 73, the Security Council, or the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So all three of these paths are invoking the authority of international law, United Nations. Next. So I got a question, and I'll chime in here. Can you be, can you invoke, can you walk down all of these paths at the same time? This gets back to our question, that question I asked. Can you be occupied and non-self-governing at the same time? Deoccupation implies you're still a country. Indigenous peoples assumes you're under somebody else's jurisdiction. Decolonization assumes you're under somebody else's jurisdiction. In path one and two, both of those assumptions go to the United States. In path three, 
Hawaii is still a co-equal sovereign, but therefore we have our sovereignty. Sovereignty is not an aspiration. Sovereignty is not something we have yet to get. What we don't have in that path is the government articulating that sovereignty. Example of this, 2003, Iraq, government is overthrown. The government of Iraq is overthrown, not its sovereignty. Iraqi sovereignty remains in effect. The government is replaced. New government is, is put in. Okay. This is a quick timeline. So, <clears throat> 1843, Hawaii is recognized as an independent state. 1893, 50 years later, the Hawaiian government's overthrown. 1898, we have the Kuei petitions. 1898, we have an attempt at a treaty. They attempt to merge Hawaiian sovereignty with that of the United States two times. Both times they fail. Second time they fail because of the Kuei petitions. The Kuei petitions are read in Washington. Treaty doesn't pass. What happens in 1898, you have the Spanish-American War. As a result of the Spanish-American War, America needs Hawaii for its location to fight that war as a coaling station to fight in Guam, the Philippines, and these other Spanish territories. And from that point on, they invoke a U.S. domestic law. That U.S. domestic law is a joint resolution. <clears throat> as a result of there not being a treaty, that is the argument for the phenomenon known as occupation. The United States presence in a Hawaii today, which is an independent country, without a treaty merging Hawaiian sovereignty with that of the United States is the ph phenomenon of occupation. That's where that language and verbiage comes from. Since that time, we've had a bunch of internal U.S. domestic laws, 1900 Organic Acts, 1920 Hawaiian Homes, 1945 Hawaii is removed from the UN list, 1959 Statehood, 1978 OHA's created, 2000 Akaka Bill. Keep in mind, this is the second round of that. All of the conversations that are happening today in 2015, the same arguments were stated in 2000. Instead of them arguing that we need to do it now because Obama's in office, it was we need to do it now because Inouye is in office. This is the second go around. This isn't the first rodeo for this. So this is both of those two previous slides connected. If we take a look on the right, indigenous peoples connects to Na'iau Puni, Act 195, Obama, the executive declaration, US federal government, federal recognition, and those things. That is that path. Indigenous peoples, that path taps into that part of our history. Decolonization taps into 1945, 1959 era, where in 1959, there was only two of the four options. Independence was not an option on the plebiscite. Therefore, as a result of not having all of the options, it was a bad plebiscite. We need to have a new one, so on and so forth. So decolonization taps back into that part of our history. The point I'd like to leave you guys with tonight is we need to go back even further than that back into 1893 and 1898, because that's where the fork in the road is. In 2014, Kamana Opono sent a letter to Senator Kerry asking, are we a country or not? Fast, they sent the DOI after that. As soon as that letter went, that is what sparked the DOI to be in Hawaii two weeks later. Once we asked the question, are we still a country, Boom, DOI is here, boom, OHA's pushing path one, boom, all of these things, here we are today talking about path one, they've got us to take the light and the focus off of path three. They don't want to answer that question, path three, because that is the critical, crucial question to be answered. <clears throat> I'm just going to jump in here real fast um, as the moderator because I think that if there's one thing that the informational component of our evening tonight or one of the main things that I'd like to have everybody take home with them is really this diagram because it's, you know, for our people, for Hawaiian people, mo'okuauhau is important because it tells you who you are and where you came from. 
And so when we look at the legal mo'okuauhau of things like na'iau puni, um, we see it here that the DOI meetings, the State of Hawaii, Act 195, are pushing everybody down this path to be indigenous peoples. Because under international law and the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, they don't really have to play by any rules because nobody re enforces it. And that what, they're, what, what Donovan's kind of alluding to is that this third trajectory is our mo'okuauhau. This is the legal evolution of Hawaiian law and Hawaiian history and of our people. Um, one of the things that we have going on tonight that I need to make an announcement about, and I'll do it now because I forgot earlier, is that we have a petition table over, over here where they're redoing the Kue petition. And if you're Kanaka and you're alive today, <clears throat> you have Kupuna who signed. I found my Kupuna on that list because 98% of Hawaiians got together when they first tried to annex Hawaii and said, no, we are sovereign ind independent and we want to stay that way. And our chance um, at the end of the evening is here for you guys to sign that petition. Um, and I encourage you to do so because that's a very important thing uh, for our people in terms of unity. Um, and I found my coupon on the list and I'm sure they can help you find yours. Mahalo. So just a couple of quick slides then to kind of reiterate my points I've been making tonight. So who were we? 1843, Hawaii was the first non-European country recognized as an independent state. If there were a United Nations in 1843, Hawaii would have a seat at that table. At that time, there were probably only 30 or 40 countries in the world. Yeah, that's how significant that event is. So today, if we were an independent country in 1843, who are we today? Well, that depends. Is there a treaty of merging Hawaiian sovereignty with that of the United States? If there is, then that explains the United States' presence here. If there is not a treaty, then what explains Hawaii's presence here is occupation. And all of this is based on the historical fact that we were in fact a country and we were self-governing. If we're going to talk about this language, joint resolution, coup a petition, no treaty, act of war, until the very last aloha aina, queen's protest, all of that is speaking to this genealogy. What the coup a petitions were protesting in 1898 was the merging of Hawaiian sovereignty with the United States. They were protesting incorporation where our country got merged into their country. <clears throat> So today we're faced with what we ought to do. Okay, good, all of that historical fact, good. Get out of the past. What about the present? Yeah, so they have us walking down these roads. Who you should be? Well, self-identify as an indigenous people within the domain of the United States. Keep in mind, we once had this relationship, co-equal. Now you're asking us to be subservient to an entity that never had a treaty with any of our people. Yeah? That we are going to do on ourselves if we choose this path. Next. This is the carrot that they're dangling. Yes, but let's go the route of indigenous peoples and then we can talk about independence. Well, if we're already a country, which we were in 1843, and there is no treaty, we're already independent. So why do I have to go from being an occupied country to identify as subservient to the United States to then go back to get this status of independence? Either we're already independent or we're not. That's where we need to pay attention to who we were. Last slide. Today, United States def definitely has the shackles, definitely has a strang stranglehold on Hawaii. Deoccupation, law of occupation is a plausible path to break those shackles. Mahalo. Thank you, Donovan.